Our speaker tonight is Dr. Stacia Gordon, and she's a professor at the University of Nevada in Reno. She earned her PhD at the University of Minnesota and did a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara. She studies the thermal, rheologic, and chemical changes that occur as a result of plate tectonic processes and is particularly interested in understanding rocks that have been subjected to ultra high pressure conditions, the role of partial melting on the rheology of the lithosphere, the driving forces behind rapid rates of exhumation of the deep crust, and the interactions of deformation and metamorphism. I think that basically that means how rocks that got stuffed down into the lower crust get back up at the surface and how they change in the process. Besides her work in the North Cascades, she's done research on shear zones in Norway, the Himalayas, and New Zealand, and several other places, as well as uh, on metamorphic core complex rocks in Southeast British Columbia. Um, so, Stacia, go ahead. All right. Well, thanks for that great introduction, and, and thanks for the invitation to give the talk. Um, can everyone see the slides okay? Oh, this is the only problem. Yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I realized I can't see you anymore. I hit all the controls. Um, okay, well, today I want to share a lot of the research that we've been doing in the North Cascades and and kind of the title of the talk of tracking the rheologic history. It's really trying to track how the strength of the crust is changing and within the deep crust of this magmatic arc system that now is represented in the North Cascades National Park and down into the Lake Chelan recreation area. Um, and just to start off, this is, of course, not just my work. Um, I've been working with Bob Miller at San Jose State for many, many years, um, and then I'll also be featuring some of the work from my former graduate students. Um, and then all of this is really possible because of funding from the National Science Foundation. So just to start out at the largest scale, we all know that the Earth's surface is made up of these different plates that are moving horizontally relative to each other. And so we think about orogenic systems of these mountain belt systems and how that thickened crust is changing through time, that of course plate tectonics is gonna play a big role in, in changing the evolution of these origins. But what I like to do is study the effects that are happening in the deep crust of an orogenic belt and see how these processes that happen in the mid to lower crust can affect the evolution of mountain belts. And so here's a very simplified cartoon cross section. And the area that I'll be really focusing on today is this area that's shown in pink. Um, and so this is where we get lots of metamorphism happening, partial melting, ductile flow of the crust. And one of the reasons why I think it's so significant is that because this is the area that links um, what's happening at the surface down to what's happening to the mantle. And there may be a lot of coupling between these different layers, or they may be entirely deep coupled. And the other part is that this is really a zone of transfer for volatiles that are moving around through the system, also potentially moving a lot of heat up to shallow levels, as well as crustal mass. And so there's a lot of information that can be gained by studying these deep rocks and finding places around the world where they're exposed up at the surface. And so today we'll be talking about a continental magmatic arc setting that was active from 90 to 45 million years ago. Um, and I think that arcs in particular are a really nice place to look at a variety of these processes happening in the deep crust and see how they're interacting together and studying them at different crustal levels. Um, and so here's a cartoon that Keith Kleppeis had put together for a paper. And this is actually for the Fjordland um, arc complex that's down in New Zealand. But I think it's a really beautiful figure that highlights how complex it might be where we're looking through a cross section into the deep crust. And you can see that in some places, the rocks are actually flowing for, uh, vertically. In other places, they're flowing horizontally in these green lines. 
There's areas where the deformation is getting really concentrated into these narrow zones in the red over here um, and some high strain where there's domes. And so we wanna try to think about these systems in kind of this 3D aspect and definitely be able to construct things like on the right here from one of Bob Miller's papers, where this is just a crustal section where we're thinking about in the orange where different plutons are in place because each one of those plutons Plutons will bring a lot of heat into the crust and will change how that crust's strength is and therefore how the deformation is partitioned within there. So uh, along Western North America, it's great because there are just so many of these exhumed um, deep crustal rocks that were representative of former arc belts. So we're looking at the roots of old volcanoes. Um, and so in this simplified geologic map, if you focus in on this purplish pink color that's labeled Jurassic to Eocene magmatic arcs, all of these are the roots of what were once probably big volcanoes that ran in along Western North America and things like the Sierras or some of the oldest back to 220 million years ago was the initial magmatism there. And down to some of the youngest magmatism we see in the North Cascades in the coast plutonic complex down to 45 million years ago. So all of these pink zones are really awesome because they provide us that window into being able to study those processes that are happening in the deep crust. And one of the advantages is that we can study these ancient mountain belt systems and they can tell us a lot to inform us about active systems like the Andes today, where we have lots of active magmatism there. We have the volcanoes. Um, we have really thick crust, some of the thickest crust in the world is in the Andes, but we don't have the deep crustal rocks up at the surface yet. They're still buried down deep. So we can study places like the North Cascades to kind of understand how these active systems work. And what we tried to do in the Cascades and are still working on there is trying to understand that crustal rheology, which is that crustal strength and how the strength of the crust is changing through time and particularly potentially at different levels of that crust because it did get up to 55 kilometers thick at one point. So there's lots of things that are going to affect the strength of that crust. And one thing that people have realized by studying a lot of these exhumed deep crust of the arcs and doing a lot of geochronology and dating when the magma crystallized is that the magma emplacement and intrusion into the crust is not actually steady state. And so here's a graph where we have age on the x-axis and then on the y-axis is the intrusive rate. And looking at a few different locations in the U.S. of the Sierra Nevadas, the Coast Mountains up in British Columbia, um, the Mojave, San Bernardinos, and then the Cascades. And what people have found is that there's these big pulses of magmatism, and then they are followed by lulls in magmatism. And then there's another pulse and then a lull. And so they've termed these big pulses of magmatism as flare-ups. And when you think of like that much magma being emplaced into the crust, that it's gonna bring a lot of heat, which will weaken the crust. And so that'll change its strength. So this has been a real active area of research for people is trying to understand these flare up events and what's causing these big pulses of magmatism. Um, and so when you're out in the field and, and looking at these rocks, here's an example of something that's representative of the flare up. And so some of you probably recognize this is up near Washington Pass um, on Highway 20, just, I guess, east of the National Park. Um, and so all the rocks that you're seeing in this image are part of what's called the Golden Horn Batholith. So this is one big magma emplacement event that happened 47 million years ago. Um, in the upper right here is just a picture of what the rock looks like up close where it has a few of these enclaves or evidence of magma mixing within there with some um, darker or more mafic magma mixing with the granite that makes up most of the golden horn. So in terms of what potentially causes these flare-ups, what some people have found is that they think there might be some crust 
and basically sedimentary rocks that are getting buried down deep and that these rocks tend to be really fertile for melting. And so perhaps that drives big pulses of magmatism. Um, and the evidence for that is shown in this graph on the left here, where they looked at whole rock neodymium isotopes. Um, and the main thing to know is that when the neodymium isotopes become more negative, that indicates that the magmas have more of a crustal component, more of a sedimentary component. And so they found what they call these isotopic pull downs where the isotopes got more negative at certain points in the magmatic history and those correlated with when they had a big flare up event. And so some authors drew kind of cartoons that look like this on the right, where they argued you have convergence going on and you kind of produce this orogenic wedge, this mountain belt kind of wedge of rocks, and that it's pushing into this back arc area and causing shortening of the back arc, which results in some of these rocks that are, you know, basically sedimentary rocks to get shoved down deep where they melt and then produce a bunch of magma that rises up to produce a flare up. So that's one argument. Um, and then what people have realized is that there's a few different ways that we could potentially dump a bunch of sediment into an arc um, that might turn into magma. And so here's some cartoon models for this, um, where we know sitting next to most arc belts, there's a big package of sediments in the fore arc. And so one possibility is that you just underthrust some of these fore arc sediments down deep into the crust. You could do the opposite with rocks coming from the back arc setting. So that's more like the model that I showed on the previous slide. Or another possibility is we also have a lot of sediment that piles up in the accretionary wedge. And so this is the stuff of sediment that kind of gets bulldozed and piled up in front of the subducting slab. And if that slab angle starts to shallow and undergo what they call flat slab subduction, so it's a really shallow angle, it'll just pull some of that accretionary wedge material down underneath the arc. Another thing that people have suggested is that some of the accretionary wedge might get pulled down along the subducting plate and get pulled down pretty deep until it becomes pretty buoyant relative to the mantle that's now surrounded by. And so some of it might rise up and underplate and kind of rise at the base of the arc and get what they termed relaminated onto the base of the arc. So these are all different ways that perhaps we can add some sediment into the arc system to drive some magmatism. Um, and so just to emphasize why we care about this is it can drive magmatism. But the other thing about these metasedimentary rocks, here's an example actually from that outcrop I was showing in my background photo um, from right along Highway 20 is, is that these metasedimentary rocks tend to be really weak because you can see all these brown layers in here are uh, biotite, and so those micas are really slippery, so they're easily deformed. And then here in the white layers within the rock are the evidence of melting. So these rocks also tend to partially melt because they have really hydrous components within them. And then when you introduce partial melt into the system, that also will drop the strength of the rocks, so add an additional weakness into it. So trying to understand the strength of our crust through time, we really want to understand when the sediment is being added into the arc system. Um, and so a really great place to be able to study both igneous and metasedimentary rocks is in the North Cascades. Um, and so just to orient you, I think most in the audience know where we are in this map, but just in case, um, the North Cascades um, arc rocks, they represent the southernmost extent of what's called the Coast Plutonic Complex or the Coast Mountains Batholith. So this is all magmatic rocks that extend from Alaska all the way through British Columbia and down into Washington. Uh, this is probably the largest batholith or kind of magmatic rocks that are exposed in the world. Um, and so within Washington here, we're going to zoom in up here is the 49th parallel. So these do extend up into British Columbia, um, but this is the zone that we call the crystalline core. So these are all the 
um, igneous and metasedimentary rocks that were once pretty deep within the crust that have been brought up towards the surface. And so they're represented by all these bright colors in the center here. And the crystalline core is bounded by two major fault systems. One's called the Straight Creek Fault um, that extends up into British Columbia and becomes what's called the Fraser Fault. Um, and then on the eastern boundary is the Ross Lake Fault Zone that's over here. And so again, all of these rocks are, are high grade metamorphic and igneous rocks in the center here. Um, and then just a little land acknowledgement, because I think it is important to recognize that, you know, we weren't the first people that were um, walking around and hiking in these areas. And so there's a lot of different tribes and bands and First Nation communities that are represented within this area. Um, so one of the reasons why we really wanted to study the North Cascades is in addition to it having the main type of rocks that we're interested in, there also is overall a whole crustal section um, that goes from zero kilometers where we have sedimentary basins like the Chumstick Basin at the surface, all the way down to rocks that were exhumed from 40 kilometers depth. Um, and those are spread across this area that's shown on the left here. And so it means that we can look at how these different rocks are interacting at those different crustal levels. So overall, the North Cascades are characterized by three main pulses of magmatism. The first one was from 95 to 85 million years ago. By the end of this event, the crust was up to 55 kilometers thick. So average continental crust is more like 35 kilometers. So almost, well, not quite double, but significantly thicker than average continental crust. Then there was a second pulse of magmatism from around 75 to 60 MA. And then a third big pulse of magmatism in the Eocene from 50 to 45 MA. If we go back to the map, those different kind of flare up events are highlighted in the different kind of pink to um, reddish colors, uh, where you can see the first flare up in the lighter pink, that there's plutons, bodies of these igneous rocks are found across the entire crystalline core. Um, and then the second two flare up events in red and then in the magenta peak, Pink, those are mostly concentrated in this eastern part of the crystalline core. And that's where I'll be mainly focusing the rest of the talk. So the other thing I'll be focusing on, I'll talk a little bit about those igneous rocks, but I'll mainly be talking about these metasedimentary rocks. And I really love these rocks because they're really important recorders of this PTTD record, which stands for the Pressure, Temperature, Time, Deformation History. And the reason why is they contain minerals like garnet and biotite that allow us to calculate pressures and temperatures so we can figure out how deep these rocks were buried. And you can see some of these pink garnets. I feel like the pink is better on the bottom of the screen. Um, they also contain minerals like zircon and monazite that we can use the uranium lead system, a radiogenic system to calculate the age. Um, and then because these rocks are weak, they also tend to record a lot of the evidence of the deformation history. So we'll be focusing in a lot on these rocks and trying to answer these sorts of questions of what is the source of the sediment? that form these rocks and when was it incorporated relative to the magmatism? How was it actually incorporated? How did deformation change through time in the arc? Were the upper crust in the middle to lower crust coupled? And then finally, what drove the exhumation of the deep crust? And so in terms of trying to get at those first types of questions, one thing to recognize is that overall there's two types of sediment. So here's a similar geologic map, but now it's trying to highlight the metasedimentary rocks in the crystalline core, which are all the colored ones. And so overall, there's some metasedimentary rocks that were the host rocks to the arc. So these were the rocks that were just there that the igneous magmatism intruded into. And this is represented by this um, reddish color of the Nipiqua complex, and then also in the orange color of the Cascade river schist. 
Um, but then there was also sediment that we recognize had to have been incorporated into the arc. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the Skagit Nice Complex, which is one of those. So just to give you some images of what these rocks look like in the field, um, here's an example of the Napiqua complex and my former student Kirsten Sauer um, is posing next to those rocks while diligently taking notes in her field notebook. Um, and then here's a picture from uh, the Skagit Nice, which is the one that's right along Highway 20. So we've done a lot of work trying to figure out the pressures and temperatures that these rocks got to, and here's a graph for that, um, where in green is the host rocks, um, and in purple are the incorporated sediments. So both of those got to really high pressures and temperatures of 600 to 700 degrees C, and pressures up to 10 to 12 kilobars. So this means that these rocks are coming from like 30 to 45 kilometers depth. So now we're going to zoom in on this northern part of the crystalline core into a lot of the Skagit Nice complex. Um, so you'll recognize here's the Skagit River. Um, so this is right in the heart of the North Cascades National Park that runs along Highway 20, which follows the river through here. So a lot of the rocks that you're driving through in this lighter pink in this area are some of the metasedimentary rocks. The rest of the Skagit unit is also orthonice, uh, which represents some of the igneous rocks that got metamorphosed. But we're gonna focus in mainly on the metasedimentary rocks and the lighter pink. And what we did was collect a lot of samples throughout this area, and we were trying to figure out the source of them and what we did to figure out that source is use detrital zircons. So zircon is a mineral that we can collect uranium lead data from, and that zircon is really strong and robust. And so when it's a sediment, that zircon will be able to survive once those rocks get buried into the deep crust and get metamorphosed, and they start to grow what we call metamorphic rims, so new growth around the core of the zircon. But we can go back and analyze the core area to figure out what the original zircon age was to try to fingerprint the source of the sediment. So these plots look pretty complex, but the main thing to know is that along the x-axis of them is age in millions of years. Um, and then the y-axis tends to be the number of zircons that we analyzed um, for the plots above. And then we also, these little dots in here represent the uranium-thorium ratio of the zircons. And the uranium-thorium ratio could tell us a lot about if the zircons are metamorphic or not. So when you see the number, the little dots climb higher and get into higher levels of uranium-thorium, that's when they grew during metamorphism versus when they're really low, they're probably the detrital signature. So what we find in one group of samples is that they have a mix of Proterozoic ages. Some even have this distinctive Proterozoic signature of one peak at 1.38 billion years ago, another broader peak from 1.6 to 1.8 billion years ago. Then there's some scattered kind of Mesozoic um, grains. And then we see some peaks at the end here, which is where we also see that uranium-thorium ratio go up. That is the timing of metamorphism. We can also look at the hafnium composition of the zircons. And this is just another way to fingerprint those and to look at kind of the composition and where these rocks are from. So the other group of samples that we found in the Skagit Nice didn't have any of those Proterozoic zircons, and they just show scattered late Triassic down into late Cretaceous ages. Um, and then in the bottom of all these images, or sorry, in the in the slide, there we go, are what we call cathodoluminescence images of the zircons. And so this just allows you to look at the textural zoning within there. And then these circles are showing where we analyze within the grains. And so the main thing that we wanted to do is compare the detrital zircon signature from the samples in the crystalline core 
to the potential sedimentary sources and see if they have matching patterns in terms of those ages and the hafnium isotopes. So we collected samples from um, a variety of areas. So we did some from the purple on this map, which is the Metau, Metau terrain. I'm still working on my pronunciation of it. So this would be essentially the sediments that are piling up in the back arc region of the subduction zone complex. Then we collected some samples in the green here, which would be the four arc side of the complex. And then we also collected some samples from the blue, which represents the accretionary wedge sediments that's called the Western Melange Belt. Um, and so we did the same detrital zircon analysis. And then there's been a lot of other people who have done work here. So we compiled all of this together. And so here's their compilation of ages. Um, and I know these just look like squiggly lines, but you'll have to trust me that when we do all the statistical analyses, the zircons from the North Cascades fit the best with either being accretionary rocks of the Western Melange Belt or from the four arc and specifically from what's called the Nanaimo basin that's mostly exposed out on, um, um, now I'm forgetting Vancouver Island and other places. And so one thing that's really interesting um, is that if we look at these detrital zircon signatures from a variety of places along Western North America, and this includes where we have the metamorphic rocks, where we have the forearc rocks, and where we have the accretionary rocks, all the way from California up to Alaska, they all show a very distinct pattern where when they're deposited before 86 million years ago, they kind of have a scattered Proterozoic signature in terms of the zircon ages. But for all the samples deposited after 86 million years ago, they have this really distinctive Proterozoic signature with that doublet where it's 1.38 billion year old zircons and then also 1.6 to 1.8 billion year old zircons. And so what this is telling us is that it seems like the source of the sediment is all coming from one place even though these rocks are now scattered all across Western North America. And what people have linked it back to is that they're all probably coming from the Mojave region of Southern California, and they've been translated up the coastline. And so a lot of people have argued for this, it's called the Baja BC hypothesis, in that you've had a lot of train translation and potentially all the way up to Alaska. So that's kind of a cool part of the story from these sediments. So then going back to our cartoon models of what these look like. So we're looking at either some of the forearc of the Nanaimo Basin being under thrust or some of the accretionary wedge of the Western Melange Belt being underplated within the arc. But the one thing with this underplating is that it suggests that the slab has to be at that more shallow angle and if it's at a shallow angle, it cuts off the mantle wedge that you need to melt to produce magmatism. So generally where we have a shallow slab, we also lack magmatism within the arc. Um, and one thing we know is that when these sediments were being incorporated, we had lots of magmatism. It was during our second flare up event. Um, and so that suggests that it was unlikely and there's no real evidence for a flat slab during that time. So we're leaning more towards that we likely had four arc sediments that were being pushed into the arc. Okay. Um, one thing we know as well is that when we look at the regional tectonics, it was in what we call a transpressional regime. So that means that we had convergence happening, but we also had a little bit of a strike slip component. So that's transpression. So that would help in pushing some of those forearc sediments in. And here's just a field photo showing some of the refolded folds that are due to that transpression. And so that was happening in the North Cascades until about 55 million years ago. 
And then in terms of the sediment incorporation, the timing of it, that's where we can go back to our zircons and focus in on these youngest peaks where the uranium thorium is popping up. And so telling us that the sediment was getting incorporated and buried and metamorphosed from around 77 to 64 million years ago. And one thing that's kind of neat, I know this is a super busy plot, but the main thing to focus on are the black dots in here are the depositional age of the sediment. And then the pink dots are when these rocks were metamorphosed, is that for some of them, the timing of the deposition to when these were being metamorphosed is really short, the interval. Um, in this sample here, it's only 5 million years. And so that's telling us how quickly we can take rocks at the surface of the earth and bury them down to like 30 kilometers depth. And it's really quick within the North Cascades. And this has been shown in other arc systems as well. Oh, oh was there a question? No. Okay. So the why we care about this is if we're pushing a lot of sediment into that deep crust, we're adding a lot of weak rock into it. And hopefully you can get a sense of the weakness of this rock by just looking at this outcrop from Highway 20 and how it's kind of folded and crunched. And you can think about all these darker layers in here, those micas that are just squishing and being squeezed due to that deformation. The other thing that we know is that these rocks are undergoing partial melting. We call that migmatization. And you see that in both the metasedimentary rocks, like in the previous picture, but we also see that in some of the meta-igneous rocks. So this is an orthonase. This is from um, along Highway 20 as well, where we see these white layers that are the evidence of partial melting. And so that's happening right after these sediments are getting incorporated. So we're adding partial melt into our system. So we're adding more weakness into the overall crustal package. Um, and so one thing that's kind of neat is if we compare the timing of the metasedimentary rock or the sediment incorporation, is it overlaps directly with that second flare-up event. Um, and here's just a map of that crystalline core again. So we're talking about when all the rocks in the red are being intruded and these red dots are showing us some of the orthonices within the Skagit gneiss that were also intruded during that time. And so the, the fact that we see this correlation in the ages would suggest that we're adding all that sediment in and that's driving a bunch of magmatism and creating this flare-up event in the middle here. But we turn back to those neodymium isotopes to try to look for evidence of that, because if we have a bunch of sediment in the magma, then that should drive the neodymium isotope numbers down into negative numbers. But they actually stay really consistent and relatively high throughout all three of the flare-up events. And maybe they start to get a little lighter as you go into this Eocene 50 to 45 MA event. So this argues against the sediment driving the magnetism. Um, actually, I'm going to skip through this because I think we might be short on time. Um, and so if we think about other mechanisms that might drive this event, one thing we know is that we're adding all these igneous rocks into the crust. And so just having that much magma added in there, that's going to weaken the rock. And then we know that we're in that transpressional regime. So we have a lot of convergence going on and strike slip component. So we think instead of the sediment driving the magmatism, we think it was actually the magmatism that weakened the crust and that allowed us to underthrust some of our four arc sediments into the deep crust of the arc. So here's a cartoon cross section for that. Um, and that we think that these rocks were probably all one package where we have some um, that had the Proterozoic zircons and some without that just got pushed down deep into the arc from 77 to 64 million years ago.
It turns out that there's more sedimentary rocks that are found within the Ross Lake fault zone. Um, they tend to be a little different in composition, a lot of meta chert, a lot more kind of igneous, more oceanic looking in terms of the sedimentary composition. Um, and so we did the same thing of collecting zircon data from these rocks. Um, and again, the numbers, exact numbers don't really matter. But the important thing is when we went back to compare them to our potential sources, these rocks fit really well with the Methow terrain that's in that back arc position and right next to our Ross Lake fault zone. So we think we had material coming from the fore arc side that we see in the Skagit Nice, and then we had some material being incorporated from the back arc as well. And those rocks in that back arc in the fault zone of the Ross Lake, they actually were also buried to really deep depths. Um, here's a picture of a garnet crystal from one of those. And you can see here that there's one part of the garnet that has a very different calcium composition than the outer part. And so this indicates that these rocks also underwent multiple metamorphic events and were possibly buried multiple times. Um, and we at least know from the rim part that they were buried down to these 12 kilobar depths. So down to the 45 kilometers below the surface. And we think the way that happened is here's just a little sketch where this dark line or the line here is representing the Ross Lake fault zone. And we think due to that transpression that's happening, that strike slip, but convergence, that actually causes the fault zone to essentially step over and incorporate some of our Methow sediments and bury it down deep. So here's the cross-sectional view of that where we're taking some of the green Methow and pushing it down deep and pushing it next to the Skagit Nice. So and then we're introducing even more weak material down into the deep levels of our arc. And then at some point, we know that those meta methow, so those metamorphosed methow sediments, then had to be pushed up over the Skagit um, rocks. And that's just based on looking at the relationships between the pressures and temperatures, where we actually have higher pressures in the rocks that are on the one side of the step over versus in the Skagit. So that means we had to thrust these rocks of the Meta Methow and Nipiqua up over our Skagit rocks. We don't know exactly when that happened, but it had to be part of the history. All right. So just to kind of summarize where we are at this point is that by 58 million years ago, we had multiple sediment incorporation events into the deep levels of our crust, and we're pulling in sediment from the west side of the arc, and we're also pulling in sediment from the east side as well. And so by 58 million years ago, when we're still in that transpressional regime, we know that our crust had to be pretty hot, that it was thick, and that it was likely also very weak. Then overall, we see that there's a switch in the regional deformation, and that's just due to a change in how the plates were interacting. Um, and so it changed it into what we call a transtensional regime. So instead of convergence happening, now we have rocks starting to pull apart and extend, but we also have that strike slip component. So that's the transtension. And what we start to see in the rocks in the field is that they're getting stretched and pulled apart. So this is Noah McLean who did his PhD work um, in the North Cascades and he's pointing out the direction that these rocks are getting stretched. And so that's what's giving the really thin lamination foliation that you're seeing within there. And then they're also getting folded during the time and the fold hinges, a lot of them are often parallel to the stretching that Noah is pointing out. Um, and so here's more evidence of the folding that's happening within here. So this is also from that same outcrop along Highway 20 in the Skagit Nice. And here's a cross section going from the southwest to the northeast, where we have these little lines on here. And that's showing the trace of the foliation. And you can see if you follow it along that overall the foliation is being folded 
within the um, Skagit gneiss. And so we see evidence that the rocks are actually flowing to the northwest to the or north northwest um, and then being folded. The other thing that we see in the metamorphic record is that these rocks are actually starting to, de to decompress, which means they're starting to come up towards the surface. And so when we look at some of the metamorphic minerals like garnet, this is a, a photo from a thin section where our garnet crystal, it looks kind of messed up. And so parts of it have broken down and it's formed this kind of wormy yellow intergrowth, which is the mineral cordierite. So we're looking at an incomplete reaction. And the reason why it's incomplete is it happened so fast. So the garnet was starting to break down as these rocks were rocketing up towards the surface and breaking down into that cordierite that's a more stable mineral at lower pressures and temperatures. So that's telling us these rocks were pushing up towards the surface quickly. And then we also see that there's more of this white material, this leucosome apparent within the rocks. And this is more evidence of partial melting where the white stuff here is evidence of that melt. And that second pulse of partial melting is happening from 53 to 47 million years ago. And we think that's essentially dating the decompression and these rocks pushing up towards the surface. So here's now going back to our geologic map, but we've added on here these, what we call isochron lines. So these are lines of constant age and they're specifically from the argon isotopic system. And so they're giving us cooling ages. And you'll see that as you go from the outside of the core towards the center and towards the Skagit gneiss, that the ages are getting younger and younger. And so they're going down to 50 to 45 million years ago in the Skagit gneiss. And that's coeval with when we have this final pulse of magmatism or this third flare up event. So we're starting to see the Skagit gneiss popping up towards the surface. So the rocks are cooling, but we're also getting lots of magmatism happening at that time. The other thing, if we step back, Here's our crystalline core over here in the purple, but now we're focused in on these yellow rocks, which are non-marine basins that are forming in the upper crust. So everything we've been talking about is in the middle to lower crust, but now we wanna look at the record in that upper crust from the Chukunuk, the Swak, as well as the Chumstick basins. And so my colleague, Mike Eddy, did a lot of geochronology, so dating of the sediments at different layers within there. So we have time over here on the y-axis. Um, and this is showing us kind of the ages as our basins are forming. And the big thing to notice is that a lot of the basin formation is happening in that window of like 52 down to 46. So the same timing as when we're seeing our rocks in the deep crust are moving and starting to flow towards the surface. So given the similarity in the timing, you might draw some sort of cartoon model like this, where we're getting a lot of extension in the upper crust and some faulting due to that extension and that forms our basins that we're dating. Um, and then in the deep crust, those rocks are really hot and buoyant. And so as we extend the upper crust, it allows them to flow up towards the surface. So this would really suggest that we have a lot of coupling between what's happening in the upper crust and then in our mid to lower crust. But then there's one more record that we can look at to track the deformation history. And it turns out that there's a ton of dikes, of igneous dikes that are mafic in composition that have intruded into a lot of the basins, like the Swak Basin, but also into the Skagit Nice Complex, also into some of the igneous rocks. It's all these red lines here. And so the way those basins intrude is that they're, or sorry, the way the dikes intrude is that they intrude um, at a certain angle relative to the deformation and they'll track that deformation. And for the most part, the angle of those dikes is different than the flow of the crust that's represented by the green line. 
So that actually suggests that there's decoupling between what's happening in the upper crust, which is what the dikes are recording, and what's happening in the deep crust, which is what the green arrows are recording. And so Bob Miller had put together this kind of block diagram to look through the crust. And so we've been talking a lot about the Skagit gneiss, but the Swakane gneiss is uh, similar kind of metasedimentary rocks in the deep crust. So those rocks are recording a lot of flow to the north south. And then we also see the folding within there. But then in the upper crust, we see a different angle for how these rocks are pulling apart. Um, and so there's a lot of decoupling happening between these different layers. So that was a pretty interesting finding from the results. So what was going on during the Eocene that caused so much chaos? Um, if we step back, here's from Mike Eddy's paper. Um, now we're looking at an area where the North Cascades would be kind of up in this area. Um, and we have the Swak Basin is shown. This black line with the tooth marks is our subduction zone, where it's also showing some arrows here for that trans, that little bit of strike slip going on. Is starting uh, down to around 51 million years ago, we start to find that there's a spreading center that starts to interact with the subduction zone. And specifically at the spreading center, we actually had a big for lack of better terms, kind of blob of magma that was oceanic crust that basically a plume had come up and intersected with this black spreading center and created a big, what we call oceanic plateau. So this is basically what Iceland is today is it's a big mass of mafic rocks that's being produced by a hotspot interacting with a spreading center. So the important part of this is it's called Silesia. The other part of it's called the Yakutak terrain that actually got pushed all the way up to Alaska. But Silesia slammed into um, the coastline here and into Washington and Oregon. Here's another map to show the full extent of it. So here's our North Cascades crystalline core where it restored about 48 million years ago. Here's that oceanic plateau of Silesia. So when it comes in, because it's so hot, that makes it buoyant, so it doesn't want to subduct. And so it kind of messes up the subduction zone. So here's a cross-section cartoon that Bob had put together where part of the plate um, above there, the Kula plate, is still somewhat intact, but where Silesia is on the Fairlawn plate, it doesn't want to subduct, so it actually tears away from the Kula plate. And then part of that slab actually broke off. And so all of a sudden, when you have this break off in the tear, it allows a lot of the mantle melts to rise up towards the surface. And so that's what drives kind of all the chaos in the Eocene. So that mantle rocks flowing up drives a major magnetism that happens from 50 to 45 million years ago. And some of that's represented by this golden horn batholith that you can see up by Washington Pass. And then that's what also drives the exhumation of our deep metasedimentary rocks. Like this is another part of the Skagit gneiss. This is actually found up on Sourdough Ridge. Um, and so it pushes these rocks up towards the surface because it kind of destabilizes the whole region. Um, and so those metamorphic rocks undergo cooling, more melting, which pushes them up to the surface really fast. And all of this is happening from 50 to 45 MA. And if we step out into a more regional extent, Here's what we have in the North Cascades is that overall we saw that the rocks had this north northwest flow to them represented by the red arrows right before the whole thing underwent collapse. So along the margin here, we see most of the rocks are flowing parallel to the overall subduction zone system. But if you step into the broader scale, there's also a lot of metamorphic rocks that are found in eastern Washington and going up into southeastern British Columbia. I think probably Revelstoke is somewhere in here or so would be my guess. Um, but what's interesting is in those rocks, they show flow in a dominantly east and west direction. So there's a lot of decoupling happening across this area. 
but the rocks that are coming here, they're coming from the same depths and they're popping up to the surface at the same time as the cascades. So there's a lot of kind of decoupling in terms of how they're flying, but they're clearly coupled on the plate tectonic scale of when you slam in Celestia into the margin and kind of cause lots of problems as a subduction zone, it pops up rocks kind of all the way over into Eastern Washington and Southeastern British Columbia. So just to conclude, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you, but hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot of information that can be recorded in these metasedimentary rocks, especially when you couple them to the igneous magmatic rocks. And so overall, what we found is that the sediment incorporation events and that there's multiple events were coeval when we're getting big pulses of magmatism. And that, that was likely facilitated this um, kind of incorporation by a combination of transpression, so the convergence and strike slip, as well as there being a really weak crust due to the magmatism. Then overall, we saw a switch to transtension. So now we're starting to extend our rocks. Um, and that's recorded in looking at the structures within the rocks. Um, and then we also see lots of evidence for these rocks starting to flow to the northwest to the and north. Um, but then everything kind of falls apart and our whole orogenic mountain belt undergoes collapse. And so during that, we see the, the deep metasedimentary rocks start to pop up towards the surface. They undergo more partial melting and really rapid cooling that's all coeval with a final big magmatic event. And all of that is a result of this oceanic plateau named Celestia colliding and interacting with our subduction zone um, from 50 to 45 million years ago. Um, so that's all I have. I'll take some questions. I think if I can get out of, there we go, <laughs> my talk slides. Um, so yeah happy to answer anything. And hopefully most of that was clear. If there's any terms that you didn't understand, please, please ask away. Thank you. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat, but Terry Gordon says, thank you, Stacia. Wow, explains a lot about the crazy rocks I backpacked through near Cleellum. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else have questions or are you all overwhelmed? <laughs> I, Hopefully I have, yeah. it made sense. I have a question. How, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to know where the subduction zones are. You know, we we have the subduction, you know, of Celestia. So it must have a, a subduction zone and we should have a paleo subduction zone. It, would you say that's the Straight Creek Fault or, you know, where is the subduction zone that we can see on the surface now? I would say um, it's it's not the Straight Creek Fault. It's definitely further west of that. And maybe if we step back, let's see, to a more regional map. One second. Um, if you think about the subduction zone should be west of a lot of the forearc rocks. Um, and so it's probably some of it's probably hidden in kind of this zone in between the forearc into the accretionary wedge or just to the west of the accretionary wedge. So unfortunately, I think a, a, a the paleo subduction zone is probably covered, um, it, but it must be pretty close actually to the Seattle area. Um, and so, yeah, we don't have a lot of evidence for it, but just based on kind of the rest of these rocks, it's gotta be kind of out in this area. All right, Shelly J asks, any idea on the source of the Proterozoic aged zircon? Yeah, so this has been a huge argument. Um, and the big question is where these really distinctive Proterozoic zircons are coming from, because they just are so systematic in so many different rock types from California, Alaska, 
to what we're seeing in Washington. And the main area where we see, basically these are igneous rock peaks, uh, 1.38, and then this 1.6 to 1.8 billion years ago, where we see igneous rocks of that age that, that would, would, would then erode down to produce zircons that end up in these sediments is in the Mojave Desert. Or the other place that people have argued you see it is also in part of Idaho. But there's a lot of arguments between this and there's so much evidence that you have material moving from California up to this region of Washington that I think that they're likely coming from the Mojave. And that something is happening right in this interval of 86 million years ago that allows a big flux it's almost like a big river carrying these sediments over to kind of the west side of all these arc systems. So the west side of the Sierra Nevadas and the west side of um, the Coast Mountains and the North Cascades. So this is something that's still kind of ongoing debates about how that works. But it's so it's yeah, it's just remarkable how you just keep seeing the same pattern over and over in the rocks. All right. Um, Ralph Dog asks, is the real logic and strain decoupling of deep and shallow crust independent of Celestia accretion or caused by it? Mm. That's a really good question. And and he says, same question for decoupling of our geology with further inland east-west extension during Eocene. Yeah, um, for the first question, I don't know the answer to that. That's, um, I'm guessing it's independent, but you know, maybe it is related because if you think about it, you know, Celestia, when it slams into the coast, it would be a relatively shallow body in terms of its thickness relative to the overall crustal thickness of the arc, which was probably like 55 kilometers thick or, you know, still pretty thick crust. So maybe that does somehow cause, maybe it interacts more with the upper crust and does cause some decoupling to it. Um, so I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about that one more. Um, for the decoupling with what's happening further to the east and where we form a lot of these metamorphic core complexes, I think what's happening there is on a larger scale, people have argued that the Farallon slab did undergo pretty shallow subduction all the way up into that area. And so around this time that Farallon slab started to roll back and so I think that's what's affecting more what's happening in eastern Washington and British Columbia versus along the North Cascades. It's being affected much more by the subduction zone and that Silicia combination. So I think that's why you're seeing the decoupling there. Okay. Sarah Fabian says, great talk. I worked in the North Cascades Park for a few seasons and love the greater depth of understanding your research provides. Super fun to see. Thank you. And Alex Osinchuk, I'm probably mangling it, says, thank you, Stacia. Great talk. Has any work been done to quantify strain rates, viscosity drops associated with the added metasediments? Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think people have looked directly at that. Um, one of my colleagues at um, the University of Nevada, Reno, he did a lot of, um, of modeling, geodynamic modeling of that concept of pushing a lot of the back arc sediments into the deep levels of the arc. And he looked at um, kind of how that affects the temperature and how much you can actually push in there and whether it's enough to drive one of these big flare up, big magmatic events. And he actually determined from the modeling, no. But as I don't think anyone's done any strain viscosity stuff for that, but that's a great idea. All right. 
Gary Paul asks, can you explain why the swatting does not have anything intruding into it, even though it's the deepest rock? <laughs> this is another kind of mystery. Um, and one hypothesis, it also has these same really distinctive Proterozoic peaks. Um, and so let me pull up my student Kirsten had a drawing for it. So she came up with this hypothesis. So if all of those sediments came from the Mojave region, so now we're looking at a map down in Southern California, there's a group of similar metasedimentary rocks that are called the Polona Oricopia ran schists that are these black blobs on the map here. And those are thought to be sediment that was underplated beneath the Sierra Nevada due to some low angle or that flat slab subduction. And so what Kirsten argued is that if you did have this, she called it Mojave BC, but this Baja BC translation, and you restored the rocks back down, that the Swakan might have been sitting and might essentially be part of these other rocks and may have been in a zone where we had this low angle flat subduction. And again, if you have that flat subduction, it cuts off the mantle wedge and so that you don't produce the melting and igneous rocks within it. And then she would argue that the rest of the rocks like the Skagit gneiss are further to the north where the slab isn't as low angle and so you can get the magmatism happening. So that might be one argument to what's happening and why the Swakan doesn't have igne igneous rocks intruding into it. Okay. Steve Bergman asks, could another oceanic plateau collision at uh, 90 to 86 million years be the cause of the 86 million year change? Um, it could be, although we don't see any evidence of um, an oceanic plateau because usually because those don't want to subduct, they do become part of the um, continental uh, margin. And so like Silesia, you can actually go and see the rocks of Silesia in parts of Oregon and Washington. And that's part of how people figured out all of this is by dating those rocks. So we don't see an equivalent oceanic plateau body anywhere in the margin that we can date. Um, so I think that it's more likely that that's just the start of kind of major subduction that's happening and producing kind of what we think of as normal arc magmatism at the beginning. The big question for me is what's causing the middle magmatic event. Um, and that one is still a mystery to me, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Mindy Bregman. Ha, says great talk and and has several questions one is what causes the jog of the coast plutonic belt to the west north of the u.s canada border and in terms of why it goes further to the west i think that's a lot of just um some of the more recent fault interactions and that you can if you restore the slip on the fraser straight creek fault it does kind of line up the cascades with the rest of the coast plutonic belt and makes more sense. All right, our second question is what causes the Sumas Graben and how does this fit in? I actually don't know anything about the Sumas Graben or where it is. And same with the Harrison Fault. Yeah. Um, but the Yellow Aster, is part of what's called the Northwest Cascades Thrust System. Um, that's all port, part of the forearc. Um, and that has a pretty complex history that I don't, um, yeah, I'm not sure about its Precambrian grains. I don't have good answers for you there. <laughs> um, but Ned Brown, um, and others have done a lot of work on those rocks from Western Washington. 
All right. Um, Keith Norlin asks, what is the nature of the Forox sediments prior to burial and incorporation into the magma? Were they turbidites? Uh, they weren't turbidites. Um, one thing that's a little tricky about it is if you go look at the Nanaimo Basin rocks, because you can see these sedimentary rocks um, if you want, but a lot of, they're pretty homogeneous and they're mostly sandstones. And one thing that's a little puzzling for us and trying to tie them into the Skagit Nice is that the Skagit Nice is a lot more heterogeneous um, than what you observe in the Nanaimo Basin. Um, and so this is something that's been a bit puzzling where we kind of go, well, maybe it's not quite the Nanaimo <laughs> and the forearc, and that maybe, you know, the, the sedimentary package that was the source of these is maybe even gone and is, uh, has been subducted or has been translated somewhere. Um, so it's a little, that's the one part of our story that has some holes in it, I would say. Okay. Daryl Tepper says, thank you and to keep coming back to the North Cascades and thanks for explaining the Mojave connection. Now, are there any more questions? Well, if there aren't, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>